Amen. Amen. We're thankful that you're here this morning. And we do want to uh, invite you back this evening to be with us at 5. We'll be having our movie this afternoon called Do You Believe? Uh, Lewis Gossip Jr. is in the movie and uh, Lee Majors is in the movie. Silver Shepherd's in the movie. And uh, so we'll be having that this afternoon um, at 5 o'clock. If you could be with us, we'd love to have you. And uh, this week coming up, your announcements are in your bulletin uh, there. And so uh, if you have any questions about those, please see the proper people in that. And also, too, um, don't forget that uh, coming up Wednesday night, we have Bible study at 7. We'd love to see you then also. And we're thankful for what God's doing in and through our church. I want to share with you a, a thank you card this morning. Um, dear Sharford Baptist Church family, even more than you know, I would like to thank each and every one of you for the prayers and thoughtfulness we received at my mother's Darcy's passing. Thank you for the food that was provided after the service. I can never express enough how much everything meant to us. May God bless and keep each of you. Sincerely, Cindy and family. So continue to remember Cindy and her family too as they continue to mourn the loss of her mother. Uh, our loss is definitely heaven's gain. We know where Ms. Doris is at. We're thankful for knowing where she's at today and we're thankful <coughs> for what God did in and through her life also. Um, also this week there's many coming up that are having procedures done and uh, surgeries done. Good to see Mr. William here with us. He had uh, another eye surgery done this week, cataract I believe if I'm not mistaken removed. And, um, thankful for God bringing him through that too. Um, and at this time, we're going to uh, give out a couple of certificates. This is to certify that Jessica Cora Hyde was baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit at Charlotte Baptist Church on August 16, 2015. And this certifies that, that <coughs> Jessica Cora Hyde has been receiving the full membership at Charlotte Baptist Church on August 16, 2015. She'll come this time. Any other announcements anyone knows of that it's not in the bulletin or we didn't make on it this time? Yeah, any announcements though? It's not in the bulletin but the last Wednesday of next month is the next so we'll be a covered dish. Covered dish last Wednesday next month. Okay. Also, to be in prayer for our revival coming up and for our, our um, homecoming coming up. Um, look, we're looking forward to that. I talked with uh, Pastor Flores yesterday, um, who's going to be starting off our revival um, in October, will be the third Sunday of the 18th that starts, and so uh, be in prayer for that coming up too, and uh, also be in prayer for um, our praise band is actually going next, not this coming Saturday, but the next Saturday. Uh, they've been invited to Virginia to, to play at a church uh, for a fundraiser for local missions in Virginia, and um, they've got several groups coming in, uh, Bluegrass, and uh, got Bluegrass Gospel, and, and Southern Gospel, and um, I know those road boys are traveling from here too. They'll be singing that same day. So I'll um, be in prayer for that too as it goes to Concord Baptist Church. Birthdays and anniversaries this week. That's right. Her, her birthday, she turned 37. And uh, 59. She's proud of 59. Hey, one more year. Get the six. Birthday. Mm. 47, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, me, I know what bless your heart means. I told you a long time ago. What's bless your heart mean? Dummy. <laughs> she just told me I said 47 bless his heart. But uh, we, we, Christmas and I celebrated. We put our in in first service. And uh, she had the money since she had. We celebrated 15 years of marriage Wednesday. And on uh, Debbie's birthday. So thank God for that. <laughs> Do, uh, I'm thankful for her, I'm thankful for what she means to me, what she uh, challenges me, and what she um, walks beside me, has always been there with me through everything in the last 15 years, and I, I appreciate it so much. And, um, we, we went, and I would I challenge you to go see, and love you to go see. I can tell you, it honestly, for me, um, one of the best movies I've ever seen, and um, it speaks a lot of volume of, of, uh, of judgment, of prayer, of uh, different things, and I, will, I won't tell you the movie itself, but uh, what the movie is about. And I will tell you the name of the movie is War Room, and they got their name from that your prayer closet in your house and your prayer closet in your time when you go to the Lord in prayer should be where you battle the most. 
Um, and I, I was convicted of that myself, and I thought, man, uh, that is actually where we should, that's where all battle is done uh, in the Christian's life. Um, and because God's already won the battle, you know. Uh, Satan is a deceiver and a liar, and uh, he, he has no control over us as a Christian unless we allow him to have control over us. He is the ruler of the world. If you were here weeks tonight in Bible study, you know that he is the ruler of the world, and he represents the world. But God is the ruler of all things. That's why there has to become a new heaven and a new earth. It's because Satan is the ruler of this nasty, dirty, rock world we live in. And that's why when you turn on the TVs every day, you see negative and nasty things that are going on. We serve a God who is going to deliver this church and take this church home. Amen. Amen. And so we're looking forward to that day coming too. Um, I'm going to ask Brother Don if he would lead us in a invitation this time. Good morning, Lord. It is wonderful to be in your house today. We are grateful, Lord, for the Spirit that binds us together and joins us to you, Lord. We pray the power of the Spirit today that we would be listening to you, Lord, that we would open up the eyes of our hearts. That those who bring your message, Lord, in word and song will be guided by the Spirit. And by that power, Lord, that we will learn more about your will and way. We are grateful and joyful to be in the presence of one another. We pray for this body of Christ, Lord, that as a body of Christ we would, would join together. That we would work harder, Lord, for your kingdom and for your glory. We give praise and thanks in your name today. Amen. Amen. You would stand up with us as we sing our offertory hymn, hymn number 579, Shine, Jesus, Shine. And the children can be dismissed now to go to the children's church at this time also.
thank you that we're in your house this morning and the opportunity to honor you and bless you. Father, we pray for the people who are not here this morning for various reasons. We pray that you might touch their hearts and they might be back in your house at the point of Father, we take this offering this morning so that we might uplift thy kingdom here on this earth. We ask you to forgive us all for our many sins. In your loving name I pray.
did it because of his supporters being with him. They didn't want to offend them. And it's funny to me, thinking back of that, and looking back at that time and thinking about how the scripture reveals the fact that what happened was they couldn't take his life anyway, even though they didn't want to do it in front of his supporters. They didn't take his life anyway. He freely gave it. Uh, just as Jesus did, and I'm not comparing Stephen to, to Jesus by any means, but if you read the scriptures with us, read them with us last week, he said, I commit my spirit to you, God, before he died. And, and as they looked at him, he was definitely full of the Holy Ghost, definitely full of, full of Jesus in his life, because when they looked upon him, they saw the radiance of light shining upon his face. Remember that as we talked about that in the few previous weeks. Well, now we come this morning uh, in, in Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 1, we see that Saul was one of the witnesses and he agreed complete with the killing of Stephen. A great wave of persecution began that day <clears throat> sweeping over the church in Jerusalem and all the believers except the apostles were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. Uh, I want to stop right there for a minute. If you look, uh, when we get into the sermon this morning, you'll see all of, the, all of the believers except for the apostles were scattered about. Uh, and so, as you see what the, what the believers did when they were scattered about, they weren't preachers and pastors and elders and those things. They weren't, a, they weren't the apostles. The apostles actually were, were still placed where God wanted them to be at, but he used them, he used, he used uh, uh, Stephen, he used Stephen to, to glorify himself and to reveal him, himself to others, that others may be saved, and that the believers would be able to go out and take the message out, not just the apostles, but the believers themselves, which is us as church people. Amen? Amen. And so it says in, verse, in chapter 2, I mean, in verse 2, it says, Some devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. But the believers were who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Philip, for example went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about the Messiah. Isn't it, should you find that interesting that when Jesus met the woman at the well, she was what kind of woman? She was a Samaritan woman. And it, and it was not customary for a Jew ever to speak to a Samaritan. You would never see that happen, much less a Jewish man in Jesus speak to a Samaritan woman. But Jesus was not concerned about that, was not concerned about that tradition. He was more concerned about the woman's soul that he met at the well than he was concerned about the tradition of the, of the Jews not speaking to the Samaritans. And so he set the example that now, look, look what Philip did. Where did he go? Samaria. He went into Samaria to reach them with the gospel. Because Jesus had set the example. He had set the example to go into all places. And so he went to Samaria where the Jews didn't go and to actually reach out to them and share the gospel and share that and told the people about the Messiah. See, in verse 6, Crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and see the miraculous signs he did. Many evil spirits were cast out, screaming as they left their victims, and many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. A man named Simon had been a sorcerer there for many years, amazing the people of Samaria, claiming to be great, claiming to be someone great. Everyone from the least to the greatest often spoke of him as the great one or the power of God. They listened closely to him because for a long time he had astounded them with his magic. May God bless the reader's word. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that these next few minutes you be with us this morning. Lord, speak your truth into our life, Lord God. I pray, Lord, that your holiness presence would fill this place, that you would bind and rebuke Satan. You would have any strong moments here in the service or in our lives or in our minds or hearts and, Lord, in our souls. And, Lord, that you would be glorified in everything that's said and done this morning, Lord God, and it will be all coming from you, but Lord, but Lord, it's thank you for what you've done in our life. You're such a good and awesome and great God. And God, we thank you for deliverance. And God, I thank you for the power of your Holy Ghost. And I just ask God that you would be with us as we worship you this morning through the study of your word, through the listening of your, your sermon to our life, that people would come here to hear a man. God, they'd come here to hear you. And that God, we would worship you for the God that you are, the God of all creation. We thank you for all that you do and all that you're going to do and all that you've done in the past. And Lord, we just seek your face this morning before you're thrown in the name of Jesus, we pray. Everyone say amen. amen. First of all, as we see verses 1 through 3, we see persecution comes to followers of Jesus. Persecution comes to followers of Jesus. Why? What happened here? Saul's actions brought the persecutions, didn't it? They brought, brought repercussions to the church. What, what was happening there? 
Saul, it says Saul looked upon it, and they, they, he looked upon them and he agreed with them. He agreed with them killing Stephen. He saw it, he witnessed it, and he agreed with that. He agreed with what went on, and immediately after that, the scripture says that persecution came to go upon the church. So our actions in church, our actions as the church, our actions that, that, we, that we do can cause persecution to come. It can cause in every action that you and I do that's not of God, there's a repercussion that comes with it. Saul was not of God here, was he? But if you know that Billy Webb preached this message years ago in the church, I didn't hear it from Billy Webb that day. I heard from God that day that a man was walking down the road one day and met a man named Jesus. You know, his life was lost and he was, he was distraught and Saul was walking down a path on the road to Damascus and he met a man named Jesus and when he did, his life changed. And that's when we know Saul became Paul. But here, Saul was actually approving of the murder that was happening, that was taking place, and that had taken place. Saul was the puppet master, and the people that carried out the murder were his puppets. Much like there is today in the world we live in. People love to be the puppet master, and love to have their puppets do their dirty work for them. You know who that reminds you of? Satan. Who's the ruler of the world? He's the puppet master of the evil in this world that goes on and that happens because nothing bad comes from God. Everything that goes on bad comes from Satan himself and because he knows how powerful a, a, a true Christian can be. He knows how powerful a, a, a true believer can be. And I believe every day that when we wake up as a true believer and our feet hit the floor, he goes, oh Lord, they're up. <laughs> you know something I shared with him in Sunday school this morning I thought was powerful. You know, as, as we look at this, that persecution comes. The Christians, true Christians, look after one another. What did, what did it say that they did? It said some devout Christians some devout believers went and got Stephen's body and buried him properly. Gave him proper burial because they were devout Christians. They were true Christians. They lived it. And I thought about it as we were studying Sunday school lesson this morning. If you know the name Yahweh, which means what? God. God. Okay, if you, if you looked up the Hebrew pronunciation of that, it's exactly as if we were to do this. That's the true Hebrew pronunciation of Yahweh. You know what I'm amazed by? And when I never got this, I thought, man, how did I miss that? That one day every knee shall bow and every tongue will what? Confess. Every time you take a breath, you breathe the name of God. Do you, do you get that? So if Yahweh in the true meaning of the word, the true pronunciation of the word, is, the true meaning is God, and the true pronunciation is nothing more than taking a breath. Every time even people who don't proclaim Him as their God, don't proclaim Him as their Savior, don't proclaim Him as the creator of the world, they still proclaim His name. That's powerful. True Christians look after one another. They take care of one another. They, they witness to one another. They, they, they encourage one another. Because the world is going to tear you down. Some devout Christian men came and buried Stephen with great mourning. They were upset. They, were, they, were, they mourned for their friend. Because he wasn't with them anymore. They didn't mourn because he'd gone to be with the Lord. They mourned because he wasn't with them. But they were true devout Christians. They look after one another. They don't tear each other down. Saul persecuted the church. Listen to what the scripture says. He went everywhere to destroy the church. You can go to Englewood today, one of the biggest churches in our area. You can go to Union Baptist Church, one of the smallest churches in our area. And, and, and you can go to any church you want to, whether it be the smallest or the number or the, or the greatest in number. It doesn't make any difference. Just Saul's in every church you go to. Why? Because as long as we live in this world, the devil controls this world. Oh, no, God's in control, Pastor. Okay, let me ask you this. If God is in control of this entire this world, why is there so many negative and nasty things happening in this world? God gives us free will to choose, amen? amen. Got that? So if, if, if it's free will to choose and we're sinful, we're full of sin, I don't know about you, but, but I, I choose to, to live for God, and I choose to... And, 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 and I think we get it mixed up so many times, honestly. I really do. I really believe with all my, with all my heart that when, when we're persecuted, we're going to be persecuted. And, and you know, I, I don't like it no more than you do. I don't like when people judge you as a Christian or say, oh, well, look at you because you're not doing this or you did this or you did that. You know what? At least they're looking to me and thinking, hey, you know what? That wasn't godly, so maybe God will convict him in their life. You know what, you know what really gets me, in, in honest, honestly, is this? is that, that Saul can persecute the church all he wants to, and people today in the church, there's Saul's in the church, and now the church today to persecute you and I. 
But you know what? Here, here's, the, here's the true, honest thing. I care more about what God knows about me than I care what man and woman thinks of me. You, you with me in that? When I close my door at night and I take my clothes off and I get in my bed, the only one that really truly knows me and who knows my heart is my God. Not my mama, not my daddy, not my sister, not my brother, not my cousin, not my aunt, not my uncle, not my wife. She doesn't know all the thoughts I have in my head. But God surely does. And let me tell you something. I'm more afraid of that and more respectful of that than I am of any, what any man thinks of me, that me knows of me. Amen? When, when, we, when we understand that and we get that, welcome persecution. Thank you because Jesus was persecuted. I, I must be doing something in my life. Something must be going on for somebody to want to say and judge you. Amen? Because it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. So God judged me at death. Man has no right to judge me in life. Woo! Persecution is going to come. And it happens. Saul persecuted the church. The church is not this building. The Sauls of the world today don't persecute this building. They persecute us, the body of Christ. That's the church. Second, I always see that good news <coughs> brings joy. The good news was preached. But the believers that were scattered and preached, the believers that were scattered preached the good news about Jesus everywhere they went. Jesus is always good news. Amen? Amen. If, you, if you look at the King James Version of the Bible on that, it says what? The gospel. The gospel. Well, if you, if you, if you understand the gospel, and you, and you understand the Greek language, the gospel means good news. It is the good news that Jesus came, lived a perfect life, full of God. He was 100% God, 100% man, put on a fleshy robe, walked the earth, and he, walked, he dealt with the same temptations you and I did and he never gave into it. He was perfect. He, he had to come. And he, here's, the, here's the most awesome thing. Do you realize the first artificial insemination happened with Jesus? Except it didn't have nothing have to be inserted. God touched Mary and made her become pregnant. She was pure. She was pure. She had never been touched before. I told him in the first service this morning, I encouraged our teenage girls, hey, you know what? Keep your purity. Because that's the one thing physically that you can never get back. God can restore you, yes. And God will restore you. But keep your purity. Why? Because that's the one thing God's giving you physically that you're the only one that can really give it away. Mary, had, Jesus had, couldn't come through someone who had, who had already had sex. He couldn't come through that because that wasn't perfect and pure. He came through someone who had never been touched before, who was clean, perfect, and pure. He's the only one that that's ever happened with. He's the only one that was perfect. And the good news is that he made a promise to his church, and every promise that he made while he was alive was fulfilled, which gives us faith to know that every promise that he's made after he's gone is going to be fulfilled and he's coming back to take his church home. It's the good news. People were eager to hear good news. They were eager to hear the gospel. As Philip spoke, the scripture said in Samaria and told people of the Messiah, crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and see the miraculous signs he did. You know why people aren't eager to hear the word of God anymore? You know why people aren't are eager to come and listen to the word of God anymore? Because it's convicted. That's right, amen. It's convicted. I was talking to my mother-in-law, or Crystal, Crystal the other week, she was sharing with me something about my mother-in-law, I was talking to her about a couple, and, and I was like, man, you know, I'm not sure why that couple was in our church, and then they're not there any longer. You know what I mean? I thought, man, it was on fire. I don't understand how that happens, you know? And, man, they're on fire, and all the, all the love, and all the love of the church, and all this, and all of a sudden, bam, you know, something happened. So, did they let man lead them away, or did they let God lead them away? And, and I said, and I, when I said that to Crystal, Crystal said, I want to tell you something my mom said. And she said, I want to encourage you. I thank God that my wife is encouraging no matter what. Amen? She said, I want to encourage you with something. She said, my mom told me, she said, Crystal, when I walked into your church the other Sunday morning, she, she gets, sometimes when she gets off of her daddy's singing somewhere that Sunday morning, she'll come here that Sunday morning when she gets off so that she's not in the church by herself that Sunday morning. And Larry's off singing somewhere, she'll come here. She said, when I walked into your church, I felt conviction. Because the Holy Spirit was there and jumped all over and I felt conviction. And people don't like conviction. They want to go where they're really not convicted at all and they can just live however they want to live and think everything's okay. The truth of the matter is if we're eager to hear from God and the good news, you're going to be convicted. I've never read His Word and realized, oh, I got it. I got it all together. I'm perfect. I'm great. 
man, I'm so awesome. It's all about me. No, it's all about God and the God that wants to do something in me. And I'm so imperfect that I need him. And I need him to step on my toes. I was sharing with a friend of mine this week that I was talking with him. He said, you know what it gets me? He said, I had a man in my church that, was, that would pray all the time that the preacher would step on my toes. And then he came to me one Sunday after service and was like, you know what, preacher? I, I don't like what you said this morning. And I thought, man, you know, you better be careful what you pray for. And I, I don't know about you, but I know about me. And the only thing I know about me, one thing I know about me is the more that God steps on my toes, it ain't the man preaching that stepped on your toes, it's the God that's speaking to you to step on your toes. Because if you came this morning to hear from a man, you came for the wrong reason. If you come to church to hear from a man, and this is what gets me too about the church, I wasn't getting anything out of his speaking. Well, you came for the wrong reason. You shouldn't come to hear from me speak, you should come to hear from God speak to you. And if God, if your ears are open and your, your, your heart is open and your mind is open and your soul is open to the God who created you, you're going to hear from Him. You're not going to hear from the man anyway. Man can't save you. Only God can. Man can't convict you. Only God can. Man can't, man can't deliver you. Only God can. Even as much as man can encourage you, he can't be the encourager of your life. It's our God. They were eager to hear from Philip, not because Philip was so awesome, but because Philip spoke of the good news of Jesus Christ. There's power in the good news of Jesus. Amen? Great joy filled the city because of that many that were healed and the many demons that were cast out. You know what that scripture says? That scripture says that great joy happened and great joy took place because the demons that were gone, and as, they, as, they, as the demons left the people, what did it say they did? They screamed. They screamed in agony. Ah! It is a spiritual battle. Now, you know what? It's, it's easy. The easy part would be to go physically confront somebody. The easy part would be to go physically fight somebody. The hard part is the spiritual battle, though. And you and I face a spiritual battle. The Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Amen? Amen. That, that are not of, that are not of, not of physicality. They're of, 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 of spiritual realm and a spiritual battle. And every day that I wake up, I'm going to die to myself because the self that lives inside of me wants to sin and desires to sin. The God that lives inside of me hates that sin. You know, I, I think about it, you know, and every time I see it, it makes me just cringe. To see Westboro Baptist Church that goes to, to funerals and protests of funerals of, of veterans and all, and they're, they're yelling about our veterans and spitting at our veterans and things and all, calling them baby killers and everything else. And then they turn around and they go to, to protest and they're, they're, they're going and protest with the protest signs up. And if you haven't seen it, it says, God hates fags. I ain't reading my Bible that of you. That God hates the homosexual. No, God hates the sin of homosexuality. He does not hate the homosexual. He hates the sin that's within him. If that was the truth and we really believe that, then we would say God hates us as sinners. God doesn't hate us as a sinner. He hates the sin that lives inside of us. Every time I see that, I want to just say, man, I want to just take Baptists off our name for people like that. It should be a church anyway. It shouldn't be about what denomination it is. It should be our church. It should be us worshiping God, the one true God who deserves the glory and the honor for it all. And great joy will be filled within us and filled within the city of Sharpsburg when we gather and grab a hold of the fact that it was God who delivered us, God who judges us, not man. And he's going to judge us when we die. We need to speak the good news to everyone that we see because that's what brings joy into the world. If you want to look like you sucked on a lemon, look like you sucked on a lemon. I, I choose to smile. I'm not miserable in my life, but I know a ton of people that are. And they're not miserable because they have a mean spirit. Oh, they're mean spirited. No, they're controlled by something that's mean spirited. It's a spiritual battle they wake up with every day. They choose to give in to the Satan, to Satan that, that controls them instead of the God who wants to control them and create them. That's the truth of the matter. Because you know why he ends with to? He ends with Satan uses many things to distract us. As we look at verses 9 through 11, sorcerers are amazed people. He said that Simon was a sorcerer. It's their duty to amaze people with illusions of things that are unreal. 
Why? Because some people will believe anything. Some people will believe anything because they do not know what they believe. They can be swayed by a magician for doing magic tricks, and it's called an illusion for a reason because it's not real. However, the scripture says everyone, from the least to the greatest, often spoke of him as the great one. You see that capitalized? One capitalized? Meaning they thought he was of God. The power of God was upon Simon. However, notice Simon never shared and never did anything of truth, did he? That scripture said he was a sorcerer. And he did many magic tricks. And boy, they were amazed by it. Boy, they were just shocked. Oh, look at that. Isn't that cool? Abby, Abby, the other week, she got this little magic set. And, and like I told you before, you can think of what you want to. I, I, you're not my judge of her. She got a little magic set. And she's playing a little magic thing. She said, Dave, look at this. And she had this, she opened up the top of it, and there was a ball inside of it, a little blue thing. It looked like a goblet. And she opened it up, and she, she had this little red ball, and she said, hey, she, she said, feel it. It's real, right? It's a real ball, right? It's real. And there's like, yeah, it's real. She said, now watch this. She goes over to the cabinet in the dining room. She sticks it in the cabinet. She shuts the door. I watched her do it. She comes back over there, and she goes, okay. And she showed me it was gone out of the little goblet. She closes the little goblet back up, puts the top back on it, and she goes, I said, what are you doing? I said, you trying to get the ball out? She said, I'm ready. Don't worry. I got this. <laughs> she opened it back up, and there was the ball again. And I said, hold on, let me hold that ball. She said, you can't hold that ball. <laughs> I said, why not? She said, because you can't hold it. I said, you let me hold the first one. She said, this is the second one. You can't hold the second one. <laughs> I said, so how'd you do that? I ain't telling you. <laughs> I was like, okay. She said, it's magic, did it? I said, okay. Miss Brenda Pritchard stopped by the other week, and when she stopped by, Abby said, Miss Brenda, I got, I got something to show you. I want to show you this, I'm going to show you this magic trick I got. She got it out. When she got it out, she did the same thing, the same cabinet she put it in, and she put it in for me. She comes back, and she opened it up. She opened it up, and the top fell off. And it was a fake ball on top of it. When she held her hand over and just pulled off just the, the whole thing, it revealed the real ball underneath. When she only pulled off the top layer, it showed just fake ball there, and it looked like a real ball. And I, and, and I thought to myself, you know what? Anybody who really didn't know would believe. When I studied this out, I thought, man, anybody would know and believe. You know why we as Christians, we're one of the weakest religions there is. Oh, I don't believe that, but you were strong. We should be strong. We've got the truth. The truth is the good news that Jesus came, lived, died, and was buried and raised from the dead. And we have given that. We are given that as Christians when we surrender our life to God. Like Jesus did. But why is it that you won't open the door when a Jehovah's Witness knocks on your door? Why is it you won't open the door when a Mormon knocks on your door? Because you don't have no idea what you believe in this. Oh, now you're judging me, Pastor. No, I'm not telling you the truth. The truth is, if you knew this enough, you could defend this enough. They used to be a country song, and, uh, and you can like it or not. It's, it's great words, what it says. Boy, you got to stand for something or you fall for anything. You got to be your own man, not a puppet on the string. That's what the words of a country song. If you don't stand on the word of God, you'll fall for any other religion that comes your way. I'm not about religion or religiosity. I'm about Christianity. Because religion will lead you to hell and religious people kill Jesus. But Christ leads you to heaven and eternal life with the Father. And I don't want to be a puppet operated by any man or any woman. I want to be a puppet operated by the puppet master who is God. I'll tell you something, you don't believe me, there'll be people that, are, that will be your puppet master if you allow them to be. You let them say something or do something against you you don't agree with, and you're ready to go right back at them. It happened in my life recently. Well, I was ready to go right back. And my godly wife, thank you, Lord, for a godly wife, said to me, hey, you don't have to feel bad. You don't have to do anything. Don't even respond at all. Why do you feel like you have to defend yourself? Then? You're right, babe. Thank you for being that for me. You know, why, you know why I love to open the door with Jehovah's Witness and knock on the door? Because I want to ask them something. I want to say, hey, tell me something. You believe you're one of the 144,000? Why is there more than 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses now? Because then you see their wheels spinning. Uh, um, maybe I'm not one of them. And then I, my next word is to them this. You realize that the 144,000 that are going to witness when the Holy Spirit's gone are God's chosen people, which are the who? Jews. You ain't a Jew. You're a Gentile. 
So hold on a minute. Why are you Jehovah's Witness, baby? For real. You, you were born, blood born into America. You were a Gentile. Mixed with all kinds of things, by the way, in America. We're mixed with everything. The only true American was the Native American. We stole their land. And they'll, they'll fall for it. They, people fall for anything that they come. Why do people follow David Koresh? Why do people follow Jim Jones? Why do people think they were Messiah? Because they didn't know that. It's amazing. I, want to, I asked Mormons, I, our pastor, we used to serve under, I started a ministry under, his wife was a Mormon, and she shared with us, she was like, you know what, I was baptized so many times for people, members of my family that had died that they could actually go to heaven if I was baptized. Show me where that's in the scriptures. <laughs> Show me where that's at. Can I, can I introduce you to something when you go into a Mormon church? They have the Bible and they have the book of, why well, they got to have the book of Mormon? Because it's their law. That's right. It's their, it's their belief. It's a work salvation. You cannot do anything lest Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, and risen from the dead. You can never be saved. That's the one thing the Calvinists got. You got that? One of the three, three points of Tula, if you know anything about Calvinism, is that lest Jesus had come at all and delivered us, we have no way of ever being saved. Oh, well, he gives us free will to you. You, he had to come first. I can't just wake up and go, hey, Jesus not come. Oh, I, God, I give my life and, and I ask for forgiveness and things. And, well, where's the sacrifice? It had to take place in Jesus. We got to know what we believe. We have to know why we believe what we believe. I shared with a friend of mine recently and he shared this with me and I thought, man, that's awesome. That is really good. I, we were talking about it and I shared with him about why children die and and young children died. And the nine-month-old baby that I did the funeral for, I said, dude, I've never gotten over it. Never gotten over it, man. I don't believe it's something you ever really just get over. And then I said, I, I asked God to reveal to me. And I said, he revealed to me in Savior where David said, my son can never come back and be with me when his baby died. He can never come back and be with me. And I can always be with him. Meaning that the baby was with the Lord. And, and my friend said something. And I was like, man, I never thought of that. It's pretty good. So I want to share with you this one. He said, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's what the scripture says, right? When was yours taken out? Because there's a scripture that says, I knew you before you were even created and stitched in your mother's womb. Hold on a minute now. To know somebody means you have an intimate relationship with them according to biblical standards, right? According to biblical terms. To know means that you have an intimate relationship with him. It says in the Bible that Joseph never knew Mary. You with me? Meaning there was no physical intimacy with him. Okay? There's got to be an intimate relationship between us and God. Okay, so if he knew me before I was ever created, created in my mother's womb, then when I realized that I was a sinner, when I realized the sin that was in my life, that's when my name was taken out of the Lamb's book and I realized I needed Jesus. Are you with me in that? Oh, it's the age of accountability. 12 years old, I was, I was told that one. You know, not by my mom, but other people out here say, oh, that age of accountability. Oh, it's 12. There's no age limit on it. Five years old, my little boy laid in his bed, prayed with his mom. I said, Mama, I want to surrender my life to God like Jesus did. I had a person tell me this, a children's pastor in a church, tell me before, we don't baptize children in our church because we found that it's not real to them. You better be careful, bro, for real. Because I want some children praying for me before I want some adults to pray for me. They believe in their prayers. I believe the Bible says come with a what kind of faith? Child. Child. Oh, amazing. Because they trust and they believe more than we do as adults. Because we've been burnt so many times, we just get into that legalistic part of our life. Seth came home in the first grade and he said to me, he said, Dad, he said, you know what? Um, there was two kids in our class that got saved today. And I was like, that's awesome, man. And I said, were you one of them? So you always check up on your children, too. He said, no, sir, I know I wasn't one. Dad, you don't remember when I got saved when I was five in my bedroom? You don't remember that? And I was like, okay, I just want to make sure you knew what was real and what's not. I didn't tell him that. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, I remember that. And he said, Dad, you know the most awesome thing? I said, what was it, a chapel today at school? No, sir, Miss Taylor told us about it in class. Thank God for godly teachers that tell their children about Jesus. Amen? Amen. She said, Mr. He said, Miss Taylor told us about it in class today. He said, Dad, she asked two people in class to help her tell the other children in our class about Jesus. And Danny, I was one of them. He could hit the home run grand slam in the World Series. And the eyes of Danny would never be more proud of me. If you know anything about me, you know I love sports enough that I definitely would want him to do that. But 
But I would never be more proud than I was at that moment in first grade. And he would say, Daddy, you know what? I know what I believe, and I'm so confident in my beliefs that I can tell somebody else about Jesus Christ. First grade. So why are when you and I are, are in our comfort zone, do we not tell people about it? Do you understand that believers then in the scripture were scattered out? They were sent out. They didn't have their apostles with them. They didn't have their pastor with them. They were sent out. Scattered among the land and still witnessed for Jesus Christ. Still shared the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Still shared the good news. Didn't have to come and say, hey, apostle, I need you to go witness for them. They did what God called them to do. They were witnesses outside of their comfort zone. They were witnesses not in a comfortable place. They were in a place where they had to be and they were scattered completely away from others and they didn't have anyone to encourage them. They weren't looking for man's encouragement. They were looking for the God of encouragement, the God that had led them to where they're at. And they understood and Philip understood so much that he went into Samaria to tell them all about Jesus Christ. That's what we should do. Amen? Why? Because many will listen to false witnesses. Why do you think we listen to gossip in church today? Oh, that's the meddling part there, Pastor. You're meddling now. And I'm telling you, when you go up to somebody, and I go up to, up to Darlene, and I say, Darlene, girl, let me tell you this. We need to pray for Cindy. See, that's their interlude. It's where kids take some taste of gospel. We need to pray for Cindy. Let me tell you what Cindy did. It happens every day in church. It happens every day. And, and, and I want to introduce you to something in case you didn't know. Gossip is a sin, according to Scripture. Amen? Backbiting, gossip. Uh, tearing your brother down, going against, going against when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me, it is a sin. Amen? But we introduce it like it's God of God. Let me tell you about sister so-and-so. Let me tell you about brother so-and-so. And people fall right into it. Can I tell you this this morning? If you listen to it, you're just as guilty as those who are telling you. It's a false witness. Did Jesus ever do that? Did Jesus ever do it? He's the true witness. They weren't going in the lands telling them about false things. They were going in the lands telling them about true things, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. False witnesses distract us from doing what God would have us to do in our lives. Verse 11 says they listened closely to him, the sorcerer, because for a long time he had astounded them with his magic. They were mesmerized by his false illusion and not the truth until they hear the truth coming from Philip. You see, this sorcerer comes in, and let me tell you something, when God really speaks to you and wants to do something in your life, he, got, he has great plans for you. I for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, to give you hope and a what? Future. And Satan knows too that God's got plans for his children. And he's going to place things in your path that will distract you away from him. I shared with you with Sunday school this morning, Facebook is not a bad thing. The reason why I deleted my Facebook is because I'm an online college student. When I'm writing a paper and it pops up in the corner and says so and so, so and so, I find myself going over there and click on Facebook. Facebook is not wrong. Instagram's not wrong. Twitter's not wrong. But you know what's amazing is if you understand the word worship, as we talked about in our Sunday school lesson this morning, the word worship means that anything is worth it. You find anything is worthy. It means to anything is worthy, it's worth it. It's worth to do something for. So have you noticed that all three of those, that Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, have one-click buttons to like on it? It means you're saying it's worthy. I like it. One-click buttons. When's the last time we one-clicked on Jesus? When's the last time we one-clicked on God and said, God, you're worth it. You're worth going through anything I've gone through. You're worth going through anything that I have inside of me. Facebook is not wrong. But when you spend more time on Facebook than you do in prayer and read your Bible, it becomes an idol in your life. And there shall have no other gods before me. Want to go back to traditional days? There's our tradition. The Ten Commandments, amen? There's still the Ten Commandments, right? When we put anything before God, it's wrong. I can't put what my wife wants me to do before I put what God wants me to do. Persecution comes to followers of Jesus. It's a given to Christians. Why? Because Christ was persecuted. That's why I rejoice, as my sister said earlier. I ought to be happy. I ought to be thankful. Woohoo! Yes! 
Thank you, God, that I'm persecuted. Because your son Jesus was. Thank you, God, that you, you, you rendered me worthy enough to be persecuted when people judge you and people, people complain about you or people try to tear you down or people come against you. I shared with my brother Friday as we were talking. I was like, you know what? I had all intentions of, of Friday morning. It's amazing how when you have plans, how God can change them. I had all intentions Friday morning of dropping my children off at school and boy, just running by, grab me a quick biscuit, and I was going to come right here to the church before it gets hot. Where I have a fan in the, in the fellowship hall, Brother John called me and said, like, hey, where are you at? When I walked into the restaurant, I, I met a godly man. I sat down. And I had been praying. I just prayed the night before when I left the movie theater. God, bring me somebody in my life who's a pastor who's been there that I can double God and that he can double me. That I don't have to double my wife. I don't have to say nothing to anybody else in the church about the negativity because, God, I need positivity in my life. Church people need positivity in their life. My wife needs positivity in her life. And the negative that we see that comes faces us every day. And, God, I baptized somebody this past week and, and the week before, and, and, and I looked at it, and all of a sudden I walk out, and somebody says one negative thing, and I start focusing on that negative thing instead of all the positive that you're doing in our church. And I need it, God. And I walked in, and I sat down with my brother, and I was like, whoa. At quarter till 12, I left there to come to the church. I called Brother John and said, man, I love you, man. I'm going to wait to the church now. We're going to wire the fan, do what we got to do. But this was a God-ordained moment. I just prayed for it last night. And can I tell you this? I've known this man for a long time. Never thought in a million years I'd ever sit down and pour out my heart to him. Never. Honestly, he's not somebody I would have. He poured his heart out to me. I poured my heart out to him. We sat there in a restaurant in front of all people around holding hands as me and prayed. You know, honestly, what entered my mind as we started to go, he reached over and held my hand and told me, you know what entered my mind, honestly, first? got to be real with you this morning. Somebody's going to be like, hmm. I wonder if they get ready to get married. I thought he was the one that said on that video last week that he ain't married no gay people in this church. Now he's going to hold hands with his boyfriend in trouble. I'll tell you something, I'm like, Satan, get away from me, get away from me, Satan, you ain't welcome in this place, because this is what God does, and God says that brothers and Christians should join together, and iron sharpens iron. Amen. I don't care what the people sitting around us think they're seeing, I care what you know, God, and you place this in my life, I ask it, and I understand that persecution is going to come, I welcome it, thank you, Jesus, for the persecution that comes in my life, because it came in yours, and to be a Christian means to live like Christ, to be like Christ, and he was persecuted, so therefore I'm going to be persecuted. That's shouting right there, amen? The good news brings joy to all people. Not just to some. You know why people walk around and look like they're sucking on a lemon? Because they don't understand what they really got. If we understand honestly that I got eternity in heaven with the Heavenly Father who created me, I have eternity with Him. This too shall pass. Another good country song Carrie Underwood sings. This is my temporary home. I'm just passing through. The scripture says, I'm just, this life is just as of a what? Vapor. Gone. But the good news brings joy. I should be excited in the fact of the gospel. We should be excited in the fact of the gospel. It's for all people. We also have to understand that Satan uses many things to distract us. Don't get caught up in the distractions of Satan. They're only to deter us for being what God truly wants us to be. I want to thank you. Tell your husband thank you when you get home. We talked about Sunday school this morning. It's brought up. I hadn't even seen the sign. I, I'm guilty this week. I didn't ride by and look at the sign as I come through. I didn't even pay attention to it. I take it for granted a lot of times. And I love to look at signs when I pass churches. I like the one that says, message, message, sign broken, message on the side. If you, read, if you read your newsletter, if you read it, some of you don't. You throw it in trash. It's a waste for some people. But if you read it this week, you'll see, don't be the 2%. I thought we don't need to put, I don't need to put an article out, a whole article. If you want to see what's going on in church, come on to church, we'll tell you what's going on. We got we got an internet website, you can go to that, check it. We have an hour system, anything goes on, we can go to church, check it. I found a, a picture, and up there in the picture it says 2% of church born people invite someone to church. 2%. That's a proven fact statistic. Are you with me in that? 2% of the church invite someone to church. Don't be one of the 98, be the two. And if we were talking about Sunday school this morning, there's you know, something, I don't know what the sign says. Somebody made a comment and said, you know, I like what the sign says. It talks about even our Sunday school lesson. 
Don't be distracted. Don't be. Don't let a detour. Don't let the church be a detour for your life. Let prayer or something be, be, be your guide. Let it be a roadmap. Don't let the detours in life detour you off where God wants you to be. That's exactly where Satan wants you at today. Do you understand that? He wants you to be distracted with all the things in the world. He wants you to be distracted so much because he knows what God has for you. As Miss Annie Rooks, bless her soul, she's, she's gone to be with Jesus. She was, in, she was our honorary grandmother in our wedding. She, she spoke boldness over Crystal. I can tell you honestly, when I first met Crystal, she was probably the most shy girl I'd ever seen in my whole life. She told me every Sunday we go to church, she said, I'm still praying for boldness in her life. I'm still praying for boldness in her life. I'm still praying for boldness in her life. They're doing a women's conference here January 30th. Guess who's speaking? My wife. I'm not saying that to do, oh, look at my wife. I'm saying you didn't see, look at the God in my wife and what he's done. He took a shy little girl and put her into a bold Christian to take a stance for him who every day in my life challenges me as her husband, who every day in my life says, hey, don't be distracted by the things of the world, who every day in my life says to me, hey, be encouraged by this, this persecution you're going under. Be encouraged by your family and your friends to persecute you because God's got big plans for you. Andy Rooks at her funeral, the pastor said, every day she woke up and her feet hit the ground, the devil said, oh, Lord, she's up. Mm. That's the life I want to live. I don't want the distractions of the world to deter me from doing what the God that created me wants me to do. So we must remember persecution comes from Satan. But I want to share something with you, and also this morning, this great God, is joy comes from Jesus. Another way to remember that is this persecution, the P, comes from the Prince of. No, persecution comes from the Prince of. Prince of the world. You with me? Joy comes from Jesus. P for P, J for J. You with me? Easy for you to remember this week. Remember when persecution comes your way? So I guarantee you when you walk out the doors of this church, persecution will come your way. It's going to happen, I promise you. Because he knows the message you just heard. And hopefully you heard it from God and not from man. Somebody's going to pull out in front of you. you got a choice to make. Whether you tell them they're number one or whether you bless God. <laughs> We used to go to a church and they gave out stickers for throwing your car. And our pastor said, you know what? If you're going to flip somebody off on that road, if you're going to have road rage, don't put one of our stickers on your car. We don't want them to know you've been part of us. That's the truth. Joy comes from Jesus. Persecution comes from Satan. I don't know about you, but I want to have the joy in Jesus. And I want to even be able to have joy when I'm persecuted. Because Jesus was persecuted. Why was Jesus persecuted? Because Satan wanted to try, try everything he could to deter him from doing what God's will was in his life. And that was to come to be born just to die for you and I. And he couldn't do it. The Satan that's persecuting you and I today, God's already defeated him. Amen? Challenge you this morning. Let him lift you up. Let him build you up. Sing in our hymn of invitation as you stand to your feet. Hymn number 307. My favorite of all time hymns written. And we sing it just like this. Just as I am. Come just as I am. You know, I saw a picture this, this past week of, of a church that said, come just as you are, we mean it. And there was a picture underneath of a guy with, 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 feet, with bare feet, with mud all over his feet, dirt all over his feet, and, 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 and dog manure on the outside of his other foot. And he was standing on carpet. And I thought to myself, that's exactly what we need to be. We, we sung this song for years and years in church, have we not? Come just as I am. Come just as I am without one plea. Without one dark blot. Who makes that clean? Who makes us without one plea? Jesus. Come just as you are. And we've become a church, though, that's been so distracted by the things of the world that if somebody walked in here with mud on their feet, we're more concerned about the mud they get on the carpet than the soul that they've got living inside than this law. We're distracted. We become the persecutors. Instead of being the Jesus that brings joy. This morning, I, I beg of you, be, let's, let's be me and you together in this, included in this. I'm just as convicted as you are. Trust me, you only got 20, 30 minutes of it. I've been getting it all week long. You need to stop being the persecutor. You need to be the persecution, the one that's being done to. This morning, as God speaks, what you can.
thank you, God, for all that you do. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for the power, Lord, that comes from you. And God, we know that the world is out to persecute us just like they did your son, Jesus. And God, we know where that persecution comes from is Satan. And God, you've already bound and rebuked him, Lord Jesus, and you've, you've won and you've defeated him. And God, help us to be reminded each and every day that joy comes from your son, Jesus. He is the defeater of sin. He's the defeater of Satan. And God, he cannot have any strongholds in our life when Jesus is there. He cannot dwell in the same place. God, thank you for the reassurance of your word this week. Thank you for the confirmation of your word this week. God, we love you and we praise your holy name. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I challenge you to be back tonight. I want to send you out with this. Crystal said to me, and my sister just confirmed it with, with me. Crystal said to me this week, she said, I want to share with you from a scripture I'm studying right now. Many of us have seen it, you know, where two or three are gathered, he's in the midst. But we missed the rest of that scripture. He says where two are in agreements, or in agreements, where two are in agreements on something, it, it shall be done. Are you with that? There's more than two or three here this morning. And if two of us agree this morning that Jesus Christ is still King of Kings and Lord of Lords and is going to do some awesome things in our church and through our church, it's going to happen. We need to focus on that and not the negativity of the world that surrounds us. Because I promise you, if you turn your TV on, if you open your newspaper, it's full of negativity. Don't let that pull you down and rob your joy. Because it didn't give you joy. God gave you joy. Go with that this week, too. God bless you. Hope to see you tonight at 5.